For our times today, Orthodox Christians, an American presence. Here is CBS News correspondent Douglas Edwards. A song about the 12 days of Christmas refers to the period between Christmas and Epiphany, January 6th. The word Epiphany means appearance or manifestation and refers to the manifestation of Christ and Christ's divinity to the world. 127 million Christians in America celebrate Epiphany, but they do not all celebrate it alike. About six million of those Christians are Eastern Orthodox. Many people have become familiar with their familiar Epiphany observances. On January 6th, in the former sponge fishing community of Tarpon Springs, Florida, crowds gather to watch the annual Epiphany celebration of the Greek Orthodox Church. Young divers wait on boats for their moment. Archbishop Yakovos, primate of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of North and South America, presides over the ceremonies. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding. He throws a cross into the water to be retrieved by one of the waiting divers. The successful boy is assured of a special blessing for himself and for his family. And there he is. Archbishop Yakovos finishes the ceremony by blessing the waters and the onlookers. For Orthodox Christians, it is not only the form of Epiphany celebrations that is different. There are differences in emphasis as well. The Western Church symbolizes Epiphany through the story of three wise men who arrive from the East bearing gifts for the infant Jesus. Eastern Christians relate their ceremonies to the beginning of Christ's ministry with his baptism by John, and the appearance then of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, and Christ's first miracle turning water into wine. The Orthodox community consists of many groups. Greeks and Russians are the most numerous. There also are Antiochian, Carpatho-Russian, Bulgarian, Serbian, Romanian, Albanian, and Ukrainian Orthodox Christians. Today, for our times, we'll look at America's Orthodox Christian community. Father Paul Snyrla, a priest of the Antiochian Orthodox Church, will narrate the story of these groups. He is secretary of the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops in Americas, and he will talk with us later about American Orthodox Churches present and future. This shrine in St. Augustine, Florida is not yet finished. It is on the site of one of America's earliest Orthodox Christian communities and is being built to commemorate the arrival over 200 years ago of the largest group of Greek Orthodox settlers in the New World. They came in 1768. 1,400 souls from the Mediterranean area boarded a ship on the Spanish island of Menorca and set sail for the New World and new lives far from Europe and the Ottoman Empire. They came from Italy, Greece, and from the city of Smyrna in what is now Turkey. 1,200 who survived the voyage settled in a snake and mosquito-infested place in eastern Florida and called it New Smyrna. Andrew Turnbull, the British doctor who brought them there, thought the climate in Florida was similar to that of the Mediterranean. He intended to cultivate cotton, silk, indigo, and other crops on his plantation. The doctor, his Greek wife, and the settlers went about trying to develop the virgin land. A Roman Catholic priest from Menorca, who had made the journey with them, ministered to the settlers' spiritual needs. Although about 500 of his flock were not Catholic, but Greek Orthodox, Father Pedro Camps baptized and buried them. He buried many in those swamps. Malaria and hunger took their toll. After almost 10 years of brutal conditions and the rough tactics of some foremen from plantations with black slaves, the colony at New Smyrna was abandoned by those who were left. Only about 400 survived to make the 70-mile journey north to St. Augustine. 
Those who fled to St. Augustine found a city deeply affected by the war. The struggle for independence from England had contributed to an atmosphere that led to the flight from New Smyrna. Scores more died from disease and weakness. Survivors went about their business of rebuilding their lives again. They farmed and fished. The Roman Catholic priest who had accompanied them across the Atlantic, Father Pedro Camps, came with them to St. Augustine. He set up his church on the second floor of this building, which now houses St. Photius Greek Orthodox Shrine. Here, Father Camps continued to minister to his varied flock. They called his church the Menorcan Chapel after the island from which they'd sailed a decade before. Although the British ceded Florida back to the Spaniards after the war, most of the Greeks, Italians, and Menorcans elected to stay. The Spanish Menorcans and other new Smyrna settlers developed a relationship with the new regime. Their community slowly recovered from its ordeal and began to grow. A survivor of New Smyrna, John Giannopoulos, bought this property in 1780 and started a school for his compatriots and his own children. Giannopoulos' daughter, Mary, is said to have been a teacher. While these events were taking place on the Florida coast, Russian traders and fishermen were spreading another branch of Eastern Orthodoxy along the Alaskan coast and the Aleutian Islands. They set up missions among the Eskimos and Indians and translated the Bible and the service books into the local dialects. By 1794, eight missionary monks arrived in Kodiak, Alaska at the request of the Russian-American Trading Company. The first period was difficult, but in two years they had baptized 12,000 of the Eskimos and Indians. Recently, one of the monks was canonized as St. Herman of Alaska by the Orthodox Church of America the name adopted by the Russian church in this country. The missionaries set up schools, and one of the native students attended seminary in Russia, was ordained a priest, and returned. In 1824, Father John Venyaminov came to one of the Aleutian Islands, spent 10 years, learned the language, and with the help of another Russian-trained Aleut priest, translated the liturgy, catechism, and gospel. A journey back home yielded unexpectedly good results, and Father John returned with needed assistance and a new title. He had been named Bishop Innocent, first Bishop of Kamchatka, the Kurils, and the Aleutian Islands. Bishop Innocent presided over the start of a theological school, an increase in clergy, and the dedication of a cathedral in Sitka. By 1868, he had been named Metropolitan of Moscow and all Russia. In 1867, Russia sold Alaska to the United States. The Bishop of the Diocese of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska decided to change the church's North American headquarters to the United States proper and chose San Francisco in 1872. The sea remained there until 1905 when it was moved to New York City. Since then, the Russian Orthodox Church in the United States has grown tremendously, especially along the eastern seaboard and in the Middle West. In 1970, it became an autocephalous or self-governing branch of the parent church and adopted the name Orthodox Church in America. Over a million members of the Orthodox Church in America, together with two million Greeks, make up half of a six million member community of Orthodox Christians in the United States. There have been Orthodox Christians ever since there was Christianity. In fact, for the first thousand years of its existence, Eastern and Western Christians were one unified church. Roman Emperor Constantine ended 300 years of struggle for the infant church when, in 313, he granted Christians freedom to practice their religion. He called the first Nicene Council in 325. This was the first of seven ecumenical councils called between 325 and 787 to decide matters of doctrine. In 330, the Emperor Constantine moved his capital from Rome to Byzantium, which he renamed Constantinople. Constantinople is now Istanbul, Turkey. The church eventually clustered around five administrative centers or patriarchates. They were Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Egypt, Antioch, then in Syria, now in Turkey, and Jerusalem. The leaders of these centers were theoretically equal, but geographical, cultural, and political factors led to the ascendance of Rome and Constantinople. 
Their leaders, the Pope in Rome and the Patriarch in Constantinople, disagreed over many matters. Most notably, the Pope's claim to authority over the Eastern Church, and a phrase in the Nicene Creed dealing with the Holy Spirit. In 1054, a papal delegate excommunicated the Patriarch, and the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated the Pope, and the Roman Catholic Orthodox schism began. Over the past 15 years, representatives of both groups have made moves toward eventual lessening of their differences. The condemnations were removed in 1965 after an historic meeting in Jerusalem between Pope Paul VI and Ecumenical Patriarch Athenagoras I. More recently, in 1980, representatives from the two churches got together on the island of Patmos in Greece. The site is sacred to both groups. It was there that St. John the Divine had a vision and wrote the book of Revelation. In 900 years since the schism, the Orthodox Christian Church has developed along its own lines. Patriarch Athenagoras, who met Pope Paul in 1965, was the Patriarch of Constantinople. The other patriarchs accord to the Patriarch of Constantinople the honor and title of Ecumenical Patriarch, but he has no administrative authority over them. The Ecumenical Patriarch is regarded as first among equals. In addition to those under the four patriarchates, there are many other self-governing Orthodox groups in the United States. About a dozen churches are represented in the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops in America, an organization which, for 20 years, has fostered cooperation among the various Orthodox Christian groups in this country. Although they sprang from many cultures, languages, and nationalities, these churches are uniform in their doctrine and belief. They accept the first seven ecumenical councils and reject post-schism matters of dogma, such as the Immaculate Conception, Purgatory, and Papal Infallibility. Eleison imas o Theos, kata to mega eleos u domethos epaukson ke eleison. Priests in orthodoxy may marry, but only before ordination and may not become bishops if they do marry. The mood and style of Orthodox Christian worship services show more similarities than differences among the various ethnic groups. Greek, Russian, Antiochian, Bulgarian, and others have chapels and churches decorated in the Byzantine style. They use icons, religious pictures, rather than carved images. Long services encourage participation of the congregation and the use of incense, chanting, and the veneration of icons and relics. In the United States, the Antiochian, Carpatho-Russian, Bulgarian, and Serbian churches are the largest bodies after Greeks and Russians. The Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America takes its name from Antioch, an ancient center of Christianity. Its members in the United States are largely of Syrian, Lebanese, Palestinian, and Egyptian extraction. Since 1936, the 150,000 member church has had a metropolitan archbishop, currently Archbishop Philip Saliba, headquartered in Englewood, New Jersey. The Antiochians still have ties to their mother church in Damascus, Syria. Many persons of Czech and Hungarian descent attend the Carpatho-Russian Church. During the 17th century, the Carpatho-Russian Church became union. That is, they followed Eastern rites but recognized the supremacy of the Pope. In the late 1890s, a Carpatho-Russian priest in Minneapolis 
led his flock back into the Orthodox fold. Since 1938, 100,000 Carpatho-Russians have had their own diocese in the United States. The Bulgarians formed part of a wave of Slavic and Eastern European immigrants to the United States during the late 1800s and early 1900s. The self-governing Bulgarian church started a mission in the United States in 1909. By 1938, there were enough immigrants from Bulgaria and the Balkans to have a bishop in the United States. 50,000 Serbian Orthodox belonged to an independent national church that had its origin in what is now Yugoslavia. When Serbian immigrants began to arrive in large numbers in the 1890s, they worshiped under Russian priests and bishops. By 1921, though, the Serbian Patriarch of Yugoslavia had approved the organization of a diocese of the United States and Canada. The Romanian and Albanian churches illustrate another facet of orthodoxy in the United States. By 1929, Romanians were well enough represented to have a bishop under the Patriarch of Bucharest. However, after the advent of communism in Romania, a part of the Romanian Orthodox Church in the United States separated from its mother church and went under the Orthodox Church in America. Albanian immigrants had, by 1908, an Albanian diocese under the wing of the Greek Orthodox Church. For them, too, the Russian Revolution had brought about a rupture of ties with the mother church. A throne for the New World Metropolitan was established in Boston. Ukrainians, whose national hero Vladimir the Great became a Christian in 988, emigrated to the United States from an area which is now part of the Soviet Union. They too broke away from Moscow's authority after 1917. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the United States of America was organized in 1919. A separate group, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of America was organized in 1928 and a third group appeared in 1951. For Ukrainians, Antiochians, Bulgarians, Serbs, Greeks, and other Orthodox Christians, Epiphany is a festival of major importance. At one point in the history of the Eastern Churches, Christ's birth and baptism and his first miracle were celebrated on the same day. Most Orthodox Christians later came to observe the birth of Christ on December 25th, but retained the original emphasis of Epiphany. The festival commemorates the coming of the wise men, an appearance of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove during Christ's baptism by John the Baptist. Orthodox celebrations symbolize this by immersing a cross in water. Some release a dove during the service. Before the custom of baptizing infants became prevalent, persons wishing to be baptized would gather on the day of the Epiphany. In St. Mary's Antiochian Church in Brooklyn, New York, the ceremony is performed by a priest on the Sunday before Epiphany. Let us pray. Archbishop Philip Saliba, leader of Americans' Antiochian Orthodox community, performs the ritual representing Christ's baptism. He immerses a cross in a vessel of water and sprinkles the congregation. This is known as the sanctification of the waters. In some churches, this ceremony is followed by a procession to a nearby river or harbor where the cross is thrown in and eagerly retrieved by one of the young divers. After sanctification of the waters is completed, members of the congregation receive bottles of blessed water to take home and drink or sprinkle in their houses. As with the Western Church, Orthodox Christians have different styles of celebrating this holiday, but their beliefs and doctrine are uniform. Churches in Eastern Orthodoxy have had a varied and sometimes complicated history. In spite of their geographical, linguistic, political, and cultural divisions, millions of people have managed to maintain a basic religious bond through their Orthodox faith. They have preserved for almost 2,000 years a tradition that brings grace and beauty to the modern world. Father Paul Schneiler, you have just told an interesting and fascinating story, and you are indeed an excellent narrator. There are a few questions, however, that I think will just round out the picture a bit better for us. And my first one is, how has Orthodox Christianity in the United States changed over the years? Well, of course, it is um, 
made up of peoples from Eastern Europe uh, who had their own uh, cultures, customs, and languages, none of them English. And I should say one of the most striking changes has been the introduction of English in the services, uh, preaching and teaching of the church. There has also been a general accommodation to the new culture in which they found themselves. Tell us, what is the standing conference of canonical Orthodox bishops in the Americas? This is an association of the ruling uh, bishops, the hierarchs, the ruling hierarchs of the several national Orthodox communities in the United States. Uh, it's about uh, 20 years old and uh, serves as a kind of uh, clearinghouse for common problems so that each one of the uh, member churches can maintain its internal discipline and customs and at the same time work together on those issues which face them as members of the one Orthodox Church. Just why did you find it necessary to create such a group? Well, the matter of fact is that uh, after the Russian Revolution of 1917 uh, and the dislocations that caused in the Orthodox Church in the world in general, a great many of the American Orthodox bodies were forced to go their own way. And several attempts have been made to uh, correct that situation by producing an institution that would enable them to work together. The Standing Conference is the latest of these bodies, and it uh, serves for uh, their common interests in the mission field, in uh, Christian education, in uh, chaplaincies to the armed forces, and in other places in which the church must transcend its ethnic difficulties and act as one body. The Standing Conference, from now on, we will refer to it for the purposes of this interview as SCOBA, shall we? Yes. What, what are the long-range goals of, of SCOBA? Well, the long-range goals of the Standing Conference are uh, actually uh, self-defeating in the sense that it will be replaced, uh, theoretically, by an autocephalous or independent American Orthodox Church with its own patriarchate, such as the Church of, of Greece or the Church of Russia or the Church of Bulgaria. So the Standing Conference is an interim and provisional body uh, doing the work uh, which the churches must do together until it is replaced by uh, one body administratively unified in American Orthodoxy. What are you currently working on? What are the, what are the present problems of SCOBA? Well, there are the, the matters of uh, the education, uh, bringing education to the, uh, on the parish level, uh, the uh, encouragement and uh, support of the seminaries, uh, uh, whatever it is that uh, the church feels uh, uh, pressed to face. It, uh, it's, the, the program is as varied as human life. Uh, at every meeting, some new problems arise. But there is in the uh, background always the feeling that one day, the Standing Conference will be replaced by a Synod of the American Church. Tell us a bit about how the Orthodox groups meld. How, how do they get together? Do, uh, do there any problems there? Well, of course, there are problems in uh, administration uh, since the pastor of a parish must necessarily uh, speak the language of the community to which he's assigned. Therefore, it would be impossible to assign for, let us say, a Greek-speaking priest to a parish uh, made up of persons whose uh, secondary language, and in some instances their primary language, might be Russian. And so it isn't always easy for uh, members of one ethnic community to become active participants in parishes of another. But that is changing as English becomes the uh, common language of the entire church and people are able to move freely from one to the other. There is no, uh, there is no difficulty uh, as far as the organization is concerned, for a member of one of the ethnic groups to join the parish of another if he finds himself out of his, out of his own area. But uh, sometimes there are cultural differences, and uh, the church is doing its best to transcend these as it can. What are the specific interests in which you have, have a commonality, Father? Well, the church, of course, uh, has this, uh, the ones that we've already referred to, the desire to unify the church, uh, to improve its ad administration, uh, to reach out to uh, scattered communities, of which there are a great many in the United States, which are without ministry of any kind. And there is an attempt, uh, in many instances, to form uh, pan-Orthodox parishes, where people of, of different ethnic backgrounds can join together with their, with their um, co-religionists of, of other ethnic backgrounds. 
this is, um, uh, I should say, a major problem at, at the present time. Another problem which has occurred just m more recently is uh, due to the uh, influx of a great many immigrants from uh, southern uh, Europe, from the southern Balkans and the Middle East, where people who are unfamiliar with American life are suddenly flooding into parishes of second and third generation believers who uh, have a very uh, different uh, uh, approach to their daily activities. What is your assessment of the chances of these groups working more closely together, Father Snyder? Well, there's no doubt that there is goodwill on all sides and a great desire to promote this kind of, of union. I should say the only obstacles are the practical ones uh, engendered by the fact that the communities come from different, uh, different places uh, in the old world. I can uh, see in uh, my own uh, ministry, which, which uh, spans almost 40 years, a tremendous increase in uh, cooperation between the various bodies so that you can with uh, great justice speak today of one Orthodox Church uh, in the United States, uh, something that uh, w it would have been very difficult for an outside observer to uh, realize so 40 years ago. How do the Orthodox groups get along with the other branches of Christianity? Well, of course, we're in uh, ecumenical dialogue with a great many. There is a Roman Catholic uh, Orthodox theological dialogue. There is one also with the Anglican Church in its uh, American branch, the Episcopal Church. There are dialogues with Southern Baptists. At uh, one time, we had dialogue with Lutherans and Reformed. Uh, the Greek Archdiocese has also had uh, dialogue with uh, uh, representatives of the Jewish community. So there is this uh, a definite effort uh, to reach out and understand uh, other religious beliefs and cooperate in the areas where we can. We have about a minute left, uh, Father Snyler. Uh, would you predict for us, uh, project for us, uh, how these two, uh, these uh, many groups in a way, the Orthodox and the others, what, what's the outlook for the future in, in cooperation in general? Well, my feeling is that um, the, the cooperation which has begun in our time and has taken its, uh, its form from these um, uh, bilateral dialogues will continue so that there will be uh, ever greater understanding and uh, we hope the uh, prayed for unity of, of all Christian bodies. Thank you very much, Father Paul Snyder, first of all for your excellent narration on a subject that is a little bit difficult to a great many Americans. You have uh, certainly brought a tremendous clarity to it this morning. Thanks Thank for you. being with us and uh, have a very fine 1981. Thank you. <laughs>